Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Podcast Tech Effect. In today's podcast episode, we'll be discussing the topic of cybersecurity. Uh, today, joining our guest is uh, Agris Cruz, who oh. has quite extensive uh, experience in this particular field. Uh, so yeah, maybe introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Agus Krust and I'm founder uh, of uh, IT Centers Pen Testing Company. Uh, so basically what we are doing security audits and pen tests uh, for quite a long time already. Great. So about myself, I'm an expert in audio and video testing. I'm leading efforts uh, to ensure accuracy and consistency of test result data. Uh, also managing one of the Tesla Labs' biggest audio and uh, video benchmarking projects. So, uh, Agris, how did you choose to advance your career in the IT industry? Uh, it was quite quite long time ago, actually. So, when I was inter, no, I in general was interested in uh, IT uh, IT stuff, and uh, which was not very popular at that time. It was. Uh, end of the 80s, uh, basically, more or less, and it was even quite ca- hard to get to computers. So, for that reason, I decided to go to university, Latvian University, which is faculty of uh, informatics, uh, what was called it at that time. So, and uh, basically, that's it. I was interested in mathematics, but uh, mathematics, I didn't think mathematics was uh, quite uh, as good potential at that time as basically IT. So how long exactly have you been working in industry? Uh, I started as a system administrator or not a network administrator for Novel Networks Networks, which is kind of, if someone remembers that, in 1994. 1994. Amazing. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, how did you end up to founding your own company? I just was interested in uh, doing uh, stuff for myself. So I don't really like to work for someone else. I don't like bosses and uh, it's easier to work as uh, self em- uh, At the beginning it was self-employed. Now it's uh, not exactly self-employed, but uh, I don't have bosses and it's easier for me. So I have, have my time, I can plan for myself and uh, it's uh, usually m- much more interesting than working in the company. Can you tell us a bit more about IT Center? What does the company provide and who benefits from your services? Uh, IT Center, so uh, yeah, it's uh, basically not large, small IT IT consulting company, which mostly do, we are mostly doing pen tests, uh, web applica- mostly web application pen tests and mobile application pen tests. Uh, using OWASP uh, methodologies uh, and uh, from time to time we are doing doing security trainings, uh, security awareness trainings for uh, employees of uh, clients and uh, hands-on hacking training. So basically showing how to hack into the systems and uh, doing stuff like this. Uh, can you explain what cyber security testing is and what penetration testing is? Uh, it's uh, quite uh, wild, uh, wild definition, wi- wide definition, uh, but uh, in essence, it's testing uh, systems for security weaknesses. If you want uh, short definition, I mean, in security testing industry for quite a long time. So I started my company in uh, two thousand. And from 2004, mostly I'm doing security t- uh, testing and security consulting. So it's uh, changed uh, quite, a, quite a lot from this time. So w- one thing how you could look at it as uh, we as pen testers look at the systems as hackers and try to hack, hack into the system and get some data, get some access. But uh, uh, if you look at this uh, landscape now, so... We, we mostly work uh, using uh, some methodologies, so this, this OWASP testing guide, OWASP application sec- security verification standard. So basically it's checklist uh, what you have to check, but uh, still you still have to do it uh, in, uh, how to say, uh, think about it, how to, how to apply it. It's not just uh, simply following checklist. If you are just following checklist, you most probably won't find much interesting so, so you still need to be creative? Yes, definitely. Uh, could you maybe provide uh, or describe the process of conducting a pen test, including the planning phase? 
Okay, so it's uh, uh, our industry even has some uh, penetration testing execution standard, which uh, kind of goes through these uh, steps. But in general, so basically, the first uh, we and client should agree what to test and how to test. So. And uh, we mostly work for, uh, we mostly do web application security pen tests, which are a bit different, like uh, from red team tests uh, or uh, other kind of infrastructure testing. So basically we agree on the testing scope, which is uh, might be testing guide uh, over space VS, particular level, what kind of uh, things we're going to check, what gonna s- kind of things we don't uh, want to check. And... Uh, uh, usually we test in test environments, not in production, uh, with a uh, whole full set of uh, user accounts uh, depending on uh, usage of the system. It's not uh, just black box testing, it's uh, more like uh, we are going through all functionality and uh, more or less uh, all possibilities, what what you can do with systems, so it's kind of involved test. Have you ever been involved in physical pen tests? Yeah, you are. Yes. So, is there maybe a particular memorable case you can share with us? These f- physical pen tests are uh, can interesting, and uh, nowadays many of them are called red uh, red team tests. But uh, it's very, uh, to be honest, it's uh, it taking account that uh, almost all pen tests are have uh, ca- some kind of NDA. You cannot uh, discuss them uh, publicly, so they, they they are quite interesting situations where uh, police are called or almost called uh, on the premises, uh, and uh, yeah, for example, system administrators us- administrators usually after the tests are hating us or. If you, you are talking about physical penetration tests, then uh, security guys are hating, uh, are not very nice to us because uh, usually we are able to get inside the buildings, connect to the systems, and uh, they are not happy about it. Well, true. Uh, maybe for those that n- know, you could explain what is red team and what is also uh, blue team. Red team usually is it's com- this definition comes from military, so basically this is attacking force, and blue team is usually uh, again if it comes from military. It's uh, kind of like friendly for friendly force which uh, protects uh, uh, some assets or uh, infrastructure and things like that. So. Uh, if you talk about definitions in this way, but uh, there is spe- specific uh, testing type, red team test, where uh, basically organization tests uh, the blue team. Blue team are administrators. Uh, uh, it's a defensive you know, side, right? Kind of, kind of. And like the red team is offensive side. Yes, you can look at it uh, this way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, which side do you like more, blue side or the red side? Well, we don't usually work for blue side. You, we oh, are okay. usually in uh, this offensive side, even in web application pen tests. So basically, we are kind of simulating attacks and simulating uh, what hackers or bad or, or bad people could do with the system. So I don't really like blue teams, but uh, from time to time I take part in blue team exercises as well. For example, NATO is uh, doing uh, yearly. Uh, some big e- cyber exercise which called lock shields and usually I take part in uh, blue team because uh, I don't l- really like this uh, red team approach in that, <laughs> that particular exercise. Is, is it like a hackathon? No, it's not like hackathon. It's uh, basically there are quite a lot of uh, teams from various NATO countries uh, which are protecting some uh, infrastructure and there is red team attack- attacking them. It's not... It's kind of similar to CTFs, uh, but uh, basically it's more meant for uh, blue teams to test uh, abilities to protect infrastructure. Okay, uh, if we're talking about the CTFs, uh, are they actually helping the CTF challenges? And are you doing them in the past? To be honest, I don't know <laughs> if they are helping. Uh, but, uh, it's uh, bi- The problem with CTFs and even with these uh, kind of like big uh, exercises are that they are very artificial so you can uh, if you're gonna do ctfs what you're gonna uh, basically know is how to do ctfs and uh, be very good at doing ctfs but uh, in real life it's a situation might be quite different so uh, but yeah it's a very good thing to start uh, to test your skills because the the problem with the real test is that uh, you you usually need permission to do the real tests well you can do it without as well no 
No, it's <laughs> they are bug bounty prog- prog- programs actually. Yes, you can uh, do it without permission, but uh, there are some risks there as well, and uh, they are quite re- uh, in some cases quite restrictive. So CTFs are good learning tool at, at least at the beginning, but uh, when you are doing them taking into account that they are uh, not the real things. Okay, and uh, how did you learn and everything? Uh, reading and uh, basically testing, test, reading, testing, trying, uh, trying things, and uh, S- yeah. so mainly self-study type of work, right? Yeah, more or less because when you look at when when I started this uh, thing, it was two thousand, two thousand, two thousand and four. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, there was an even term CTF actually. <laughs> Uh, we started with uh, trainings. Actually, I took part for uh, uh, maybe someone knows zonehorg website, which was uh, active uh, at that time. So it was kind of like hackers ca- hacker community where people could post uh, their achievements in the facing other websites. So basically, it's kind of in gr- was operating in kind of great zone and uh, sc- script kiddies or uh, good hackers basically could uh, post the achievements or the face at this particular site and post it on zone age and uh, and we were doing uh, hands-on hacking trainings around the world so i was i was doing trainings uh, here in latvia estonia germany denmark united kingdom korea, republic of korea and so on so uh, it was uh, c- an interesting time. So and amazing during trainings, we had kind of like uh, CTFs for the people uh, during the trainings to com- uh, uh, complete the assignments, but we didn't call them the CTFs. Okay, uh, have have there ever been a situation where you are unable to find the vulnerabilities during a pen test, and what options options there are available to you? Uh, it's uh, the the problem with finding vulnerabilities. It's not the problem with finding vulnerabilities. Uh, we are basically our approach uh, for uh, security testing is try to find almost all vulnerabilities which are possible to find. So, so for that reason, you usually could find some uh, low risk things, misconfigurations, which are not really serious. So it's. Uh, they probably have have been couple of pen tests for clients which uh, we are testing for years uh, various systems where there are sometimes systems where it, there is no any serious vulnerability so basically it's uh, one or two findings which with low risk uh, low risk problems but uh, usually it's a mix of high risk critical and so on so uh, ha- have you come across any zero days uh, vulnerability. Uh, yes, we we have done uh, me me myself and uh, colleagues uh, have found some new vulnerabilities in commercial software and things like that. Will you call it zero day? I don't think so because uh, everyone has uh, a bit different uh, definition about zero day. But theoretically, zero day is a vulnerabi- vulnerability which you don't have the fix and uh, which is actively exploited. So. For that reason, I, I could not tell that we could have found zero days in that sense, but we have found uh, some new vulnerabilities in uh, various, uh, for example, in JIRA, there are a couple of vulnerabilities my one colleague found. I have found a couple of vulnerabilities in some routers. And uh, Have you ever been caught and removed from a network file conducting a pen test when you're doing external pen tests? Now you mean that administrators have caught us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sometimes it, it happens, but uh, not usually. In many cases, if uh, if it uh, pure red team test it, uh, then uh, administrators might block us. But we are not not doing them quite regularly, so quite rarely. Even if it's infrastructure test, it's more or less authorized, then uh, more or less administrators know that uh, things are happening, so they are not kicking us out. So, and have there been a situation where the ad- network administrator is like uh, creating a pen test more difficult? Just before you do your work, so they not really. So in in general, uh, uh, how 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 at least it works in uh, our pen tests and uh, what sh- uh, how we are working usually. So the main cl- main client uh, almost always is IT uh, IT department director. So he plans for it and uh, he's. Uh, uh, he usually makes sure that uh, he fixes some things before the pen test. 
but uh, I don't think it's making us, uh, making life difficult for us because the reason for pain test are actu- is actually to find uh, vulnerabilities and if the administrators are able to close them before the test, also making us li- uh, our life uh, harder, it's actually a good thing. Yeah, what are the different types of cyber attacks and how do they work? Uh, s- different types of cyber attacks, it's, uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's a very, uh, very wide topic. Well, actually. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, there might be some phishing attacks which are kind of popular for uh, various reasons. Uh, they are uh, nation-state attacks which combine various uh, means. It's, uh, there could be denial of service attacks which, uh, yeah, it, uh, again, different types which are pure network attacks, application level attacks in, uh, and so on. So, and yeah, how to protect uh, against them, it's again a v- very long discussion. <laughs> okay, uh, as we know there's uh, DDoS, right? Uh, yeah. How do hackers conduct a distributed denial uh, of service and how it can be mitigated? From the administrative perspective, it's, uh, regarding mitigation, it's actually quite hard to mitigate them. So, but uh, how hackers attacking? So, they they are can, they are more than one type of denial of service attacks. So, they are pure network level attacks. For example, when uh, someone sends uh, using, for example, UDP protocol, sends some uh, small data to some uh, vulnerable systems. And these systems respond uh, with uh, a large amount of data. And uh, during this attack, this UDP packet, which is sent out to this vulnerable device, uh, has uh, forged uh, source IP address. So vulnerable device doesn't send response back to the attacker, but sends to the victim. So, for and you can actually amplify. Uh, if you know quite a lot of these uh, vulnerable devices, you can uh, do quite quite a good amplification and uh, make uh, big traffic to, to the tar- target. But uh, mitigation in, in this case is simple, that uh, basically each network should check uh, does packets leaving its network make sense. So if uh, someone sends, for example, pa- UDP packet to some other destination with... Uh, source IP address which is not in your network so definitely this uh, IP packet should not leave uh, this network so uh, fixing vulnerable devices this is uh, another matter because uh, usually the guy who is vulnerable device doesn't even know that something bad is happening and actually doesn't uh, dis- disrupt the his service so for that I don't think he's uh, gonna do something is it so for and uh, from as a recipient of this attack so you should uh, make sure that your internet service provider could provide you with DDoS attack so DDoS attack protection so be, so that uh, all the traffic is uh, basically see, uh, is not reaching you so he detects it but uh, they are kind of a bit, uh, a lot, uh, kind of more uh, types of DDoS attacks, but uh, there is in, uh, the attack which is in application level, where you have to make this uh, connection to the system. Usually it's, again, done with vulnerable devices, some internet-facing facing routers, uh, cameras, and things like that. So these cameras are connecting to system, and, uh, for example, with the HTTP protocol, and uh, basically making requests to the system. And this is kind of very hard to protect against these attacks. And you don't need so much traffic and you can uh, basically kill many websites with a small amount of... And uh, what about SQL uh, injection attacks? Oh, these are very interesting uh, attacks. Uh, have when we were doing trainings, actually, which was uh, beginning to start doing, t- uh, beginning doing trainings in the beginning of 2000s, it was uh, usually before each training session, we went uh, to Google, uh, did some search to find SQL injection attacks, uh, uh, vulnerabilities, actually. And you can how do you exploit the vulnerabilities in the database? Okay, uh, rega- yeah, I was <laughs> <laughs> uh, starting about exploiting. So see, uh, at, at the beginning, for those who don't know what is SQL injection, SQL injection is uh, basically a, a 
security problem where attacker could send some arbitrary data to application it and it's going to be ex- executed in database underlying database so you can uh, extract data from the database run com- commands on server sometimes and uh, sometimes modify the data so and it it is very very long a very old vulnerability in that sense that uh, from time i was in security uh, testing business it it was relevant sometimes uh, at some uh, some years it went down but nowadays actually it's uh, quite uh, not as co- very common but uh, some maybe 5 maybe 10% of pen tests we see SQL injection vulnerabilities. The difference between uh, those times in 2004, for example, and nowadays, that nowadays if, if it's going to be SQL injection, it most probably w- going to be blind SQL injection. So that uh, so there are different types of uh, injections. Yes, uh, blind is more more difficult to exploit because you don't see any output usually. You are working with uh, sleep statements and SQL queries and using them to extract the data. But uh, in 2004, you can uh, do just a simple Google query, uh, find a bunch of sites with SQL injection, and uh, basically you can dump the databases and uh, extract user passwords because in 2004, uh, many systems uh, stored clear text uh, passwords in the databases. Or uh, use, for example, this trick uh, with or statement in login form and login in uh, quite a lot of uh, CMSs and things like that. And how, how do organizations detect and uh, mitigate the ongoing injection attack, for example? Uh, you can use web application firewalls, okay. which uh, might prevent uh, them, but uh, it's not guaranteed that it's going to prevent. And uh, so basically you should... Uh, uh, Check your, uh, implement a good logging policy. For example, OWASP recommends that uh, you should uh, log uh, in you to your logging system uh, exception when uh, data validation checks fail. So that uh, if someone even tries to un- to find SQL injection vul- vulnerability, you should see in your logs that there is a problem, that uh, this data didn't pass uh, input validation checks. And so basically this is... Uh, almost only way how to detect some things. If we compare the 2000 and the year now, how has the SQL injection attacks evolved over time? And what can organizations do to uh, stay ahead of these threats? Soft, uh, good software development practices. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main answer and, to everything. And, and testing. So y- you should implement good software de- development practices, testing, make sure that you are not using concatenated strings, uh, making uh, SQL injection queries, but uh, and uh, using some frameworks on libraries to sanitize input, and uh, which is uh, that is the reason actually why they are not as common as, for example, twenty years ago. So and uh, nowadays they are usually bl- uh, totally blind injections when you need sleep statements, and it's very very rare to find. Uh, so-called union-based SQL injections when you could see the output of the database on the screen. So they are easy to exploit, easy to find. For, But still it's possible. Probably you can use Google, DuckDuckGo, or some other search engine to search for interesting sites which which, uh, which has potential for SQL injections. Uh, how about man-in-the-middle attack? How can it be detected and uh, prevented if an attacker conducts one? Uh Again, fortunately, technologies are uh, helping us in that way. That, uh, uh, we have TLS and uh, all these services, and it's uh, if we are looking for uh, looking at the middle, middle attacks, so then it's almost it's very hard to pull out. Uh, pull basically, to do nowadays, because if the system is using TLS and uh, uh, encrypt the traffic, they are. Uh, there are still possibilities, for example, in Windows networks uh, using uh, weaknesses in SMB protocol using, for example, a tool like Responder to uh, do these men and middle attacks. But uh, if you if you are using modern applications using HTTPS and uh, so, what 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 tools do they common. use? Sorry, what tools do they use for the middle? It used to be quite a lot of tools. So basically, R poisoning. Uh, you can, uh, but uh, yeah, 
can enable very very old tool for window for windows uh, but uh, uh, nowadays i guess the most most successful tool would be responder which is uh, no, might say this is kind of ma- man in the middle attack so where you can uh, gather uh, uh, windows creden- uh, credential hashes and then try to escalate things and uh, try to guess the passwords or try to hijack the connections but uh, uh, in the usual it's if you look at typical organization and if you are using cloud services and uh, office in the cloud most probably attackers will, will gonna have a very hard time to exploiting you but if sti- sti- still you have uh, all file servers in your organization so it's easier for uh, attacker if he has access to your local network in internet, I would say it's uh, very difficult to pull out, uh, basically do these uh, many middle attacks if you are not nation state. Okay. Why is that? No, probably nation states are able are uh, some possibilities to forge certificates. So basically, to get inside TLS connection, you have to able to make your own t- certificates for popular sites and uh, nation states are able actually to redirect internet traffic using BGP protocol weaknesses and uh, uh, steal some data in that way. So if it's a regular hacker which is for which uh, basically wants to have uh, ransom payments most probably he won't be able to do it. Of course if the other possibilities of course is that you are not using TLS correctly so <laughs> Uh, then it's easier, of course. But if you are using TLS correctly, it's uh, very hard. If we're speaking about ransom, uh, ransomware attacks, how can organizations prevent them? And how do hackers organize them or create? Uh, usually normal security practices. So basically, if we are uh, looking at uh, small countries like our, where, where we have small uh, companies, most probably you should not uh, put some uh, services on internet. For example, a remote desktop is very, very bad idea. File services on internet is very, very bad idea because these are potential entry points for these attacks. And uh, if you are a bigger organization, you most probably have to train your employees for uh, phishing attacks and uh, so that they can understand that phishing attack is uh, happening. Uh, it definitely won't prevent uh, all the risks regarding phishing attacks and ransomware, but at least uh, it will be harder for attacker. Okay. Um, if we're going back to the penetration testing, right, uh, what do you do if you break the allowed limits in a pen test? We usually try not to break them. <laughs> usually, <laughs> but what it happens some, sometime maybe? Uh, right? It's... Uh, uh, we sh- uh, we talk with client, but uh, usually it doesn't happen. So we have so sometimes the problem is that sometimes client might uh, forget uh, to define these limits, uh, and uh, technically we are not breaking them. But uh, yeah, it's uh, at least it's it means that client didn't think about this. But we usually don't uh, don't break limits in in pen tests, and if it's potentially risky thing, we talk with client and agree uh, are we doing it and where we are doing it but uh, there were situ- situations where for example we did port scan from a uh, compromised web server for internal network and uh, some storage system uh, some network uh, went down da- st- storage array went down and rebooted and uh, this uh, storage array net- storage uh, array was uh, basically providing disks for billing system and it was Client was not very happy, but uh, then again, uh, he didn't war- warn us about it and uh, other things that internal network and the system should not be available from uh, DMZ and from web servers. So, on, on uh, what kind of system is the most easiest way to perform pen tests? It's it's hard to say that uh, it's easier to perform te- pen test on uh, some systems. So. Uh, I don't think they are easy ones or uh, hard ones. So, uh, if it's static web page, uh, it's the easiest because there is nothing, almost nothing to test, and uh, very easy to do do the pen test. But most probably, you won't find anything interesting if it's uh, a very complex system. Uh, 
So yeah, it's uh, it's uh, very complicated. For example, I w- I would say that uh, you you should you m- might might be asking which are the most difficult systems to test uh, to do pen tests. Well, we can rephrase like that. Yeah, it's uh, we have seen for example systems where. Um, when you do improper inputting, for example, are posting some SQL injection payloads, cross-site scripting payloads, system just logs you out when it detects it. Very hard to test such systems. There are some frameworks which are uh, basically sending back to the system your mouse clicks uh, in basically where you are, uh, what you are doing on particular part of the page, and it's very hard to guess what kind of uh, input data are uh, basically you should send and in these particular cases but uh, if it's uh, yeah, easiest would be probably some uh, custom main systems very simple PHP systems where it's uh, easy to find things and easy to break things okay uh, as we know there's a thing called uh, honeypot in cyber security right um, how can you describe it what is honeypot and how does it actually work in general, Honeypot is the system you put out hoping that attackers are going to notice it and uh, start attacking it and start uh, gathering information and you can going uh, uh, get alerts that there is something wrong going on in the network. So this is, uh, in essence, how you could use it in uh, your regular network. Uh, there are Honeypots which are put by security researchers, for example, uh, to basically say the vulnerable systems or just uh, regular systems uh, on internet where they should not be and uh, they are analyzing attack patterns and how they are uh, these systems are being being attacked so this is uh, this is another use of honeypots and uh, are there different type of honeypots they are definitely <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically you think about any it service and it could be honeypot oh okay and um what is the potential risk and drawback of using a honeypot? If you are doing it correctly, probably there is no big risks, but you should uh, isolate it from the network and um, basically and think about that it's still just one part of your IT security posture or IT security strategy, so that uh, it's... Uh, don't uh, maybe hackers gonna be able to penetrate your network and your honeypot uh, won't uh, notify you so they they might be uh, such possibility as well for for that reason it's uh, kind of very good too but it's uh, yeah it's not not that it uh, gonna give you hundred percent hundred percent ideas that you are safe uh, how do we integrate the honeypot into into cyber security strategy for example monitoring monitoring so monitoring so basically you want to get uh, some uh, information from honeypot that something is going on so if you have some uh, monitoring team blue team which are monitoring log files so probably they or monitoring system availability they should get notifications from honeypot that something uh, bad is going on so if you don't have such uh, blue team or uh, monitoring team which monitors the activity in your network, so just putting out honeypot, I don't think it can uh, give you any any benefit. So there's also intrusion detection system in the cyber security, right? Uh, how does it work and are there different types of it? Uh, they are looking for attacks. So basically, there are benefits and th- there are risks in uh, intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, which uh, are kind of active systems. When they are uh, detecting some uh, threats, they are gonna block this uh, attack, so block IP address or something like that. So uh, uh, regarding so I- IDS works together with a honeypot, right? No, uh, but you can create different uh, difference. IDS is uh, like. Uh, it's uh, IDS monitors network traffic usually. Uh, this n- network traffic IDS or uh, host-based IDS monitors behavior on the host itself. So Honeypot is a vulnerable system or just interesting system okay. which you are putting in your local network or co- corporate network or outside network which 
you hope going to attract the hackers. IDS is just a software or hardware device, a software program or hardware device which are monitoring your network traffic or monitoring uh, activities on the host. So what kind of programs are running and uh, what they are doing and... Uh, it's a bit different. So, but the problem is that uh, they are usually signature based or uh, uh, heuristic based. So, hackers are, uh, might be able to fool them. This is one, one risk of IDS. Is again, they g- not going to give you hundred percent insurance that everything is fine. Other thing is that uh, I mentioned before that almost all traffic is encrypted nowadays with TLS. If it's TLS traffic, IDS won't see any problems in it because it's encrypted and it's not able to see. Uh, your your approach might be to decrypt the traffic, but uh, then you have to install some special software on uh, uh, certificates on software on uh, client compute on your office computer so that IDS could dec- decrypt the traffic and uh, see inside these uh, things, and it, it creates uh, additional risks. Uh. Can you maybe explain how the cryptography and encryption work and uh, different types of the encryption algorithms? Oh, how, how it works. Again, I'm not <laughs> think, uh, basically expert in encryption. So, But okay. basically, you could, uh, uh, in internet, you can look at uh, two types of encryption, which is symmetrical encryption. So basically, where you have one key to encrypt and decrypt the data and uh, public key encryption systems where so basically you are using two separate keys to encrypt the data and the different key to decrypt the data. Uh, again, if you look at uh, how modern internet works, so mo- it's a combination of both. So for example, TLS uses uh, uh, public key cryptography to establish a connection and uh, basically to exchange these symmetrical keys and afterwards uh, all the traffic is encrypted by symmetrical keys they might be rotated from time to time and uh, so basically this is how it works uh, to work it uh, work uh, properly you have to have some uh, very secret public private key on the server on both sides of the server so and uh, you definitely have to protect it because if someone steals this uh, private key, he theoretically could uh, comprom- compromise security of these TLS connections. Uh, if you are using PGP, uh, modern uh, e- e-signature systems, they are all using similar uh, architecture. So there is public key cryptography and... Uh, uh, real encryption is uh, done with symmetrical key. The reason is why why it's not encrypted with public key. It's just it's uh, very resource intensive. So symmetrical key encryption is much more much more faster. Uh, what are the benefits and drawbacks of using the firewall? Uh, yeah, uh, firewall. You should definitely use the firewall. It's a uh, uh, practice which uh, comes from uh, I, I I don't know when it started exactly the practice of using firewalls, but it was uh, definitely 20 years ago or <laughs> even more. So basically firewall will just make sure that you are exposing only services you want to expose so to some uh, internet, to external network and things like that. So, And uh, this is a benefit. So it uh, it's additional layer of control for your services. If s- some application opens the port on your computer or whatever, so... Firewall's g- firewall gonna block it if it's uh, not allowed. At least the, it should be configured like that. So drawbacks of firewalls, you have to basically, if it's a big organization, it's a bunch of complicated rules. So what what port should be open from what IP addresses, and it's uh, very hard to make sure that it's up to date that you are closing ports uh, in. Uh, timely manner and things like that so this uh, overhead of course but uh, so it's the main vulnerability of firewall the for firewalls are software packages so uh, software or hardware uh, packages which might have vulnerabilities in itself of course but uh, it's uh, kind of uh, if you are not exposing some management interfaces or uh, things like that so usually they are pretty secure of course it's not guaranteed that there is not vulnerability which uh, might uh, affect and the fire, the f- a firewall itself but 
they are not very they are very very rare and how can hackers exploit uh, the firewall basically the only firewall is just protection between uh, your services and some other network so usually uh, the exploitation is just uh, they are not exploiting actually firewall firewall in itself it's not very interesting piece of uh, software or hardware actually it's just a uh, wall which protects other services and uh, for example you have access to internal network and you want to e- extract some data from it but you are not able to connect to your uh, external services because firewall is blocking ssh uh, http to your network and basically you are stuck but you can uh, th- think creatively, s- for example, use DNS, which might <laughs> be allowed uh, to basically travel outside the network. So uh, encapsulate the data you are extracting into DNS packets and the firewall going to p- most probably pass it through. So this is uh, how usually firewalls are exploited. So basically you look what's allowed in the firewall and basically try to encapsulate uh, information information you are extracting or uh, common connections, SSH connections in uh, allowed uh, basically data stream. So, Okay. Uh, how do you stay up to date on the latest cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities? Read, uh, read Twitter, read <laughs> Mastodon, probably <laughs> because uh, security community have migrated mostly to Mastodon. Uh, network read uh, articles follow blogs follow researchers so basically yeah and uh, what would be your professional opinion on uh, future of cyber security and penetration testing I, no one knows it actually so probably it's going to be important uh, is machine machine learning and artificial, artificial intel- intelligence will change something definitely going to change something but uh, the interesting thing is that uh, when we st- when I started pen testing, uh, the SOAS top 10 w- top most popular vulnerabilities are almost the same as nowadays. So basically, it was SQL inj- th- there was SQL injection. It still uh, can in some form is uh, interesting. Cross site scripting is still interesting. There are a couple of new attacks uh, we didn't talk about. Uh, maybe s- uh, server side request forgeries and uh, all all other things can can we can you maybe describe the cross site scripting and uh, forgeries as well cross site scripting is ability for attacker to execute javascript in uh, somewhere usually <laughs> in a uh, victims browser usually but it's not uh, not only victims browser server side request forgery is that uh, you can make a uh, server web server make some requests on your behalf so that uh, you send sp- specific query and server gonna send the request and maybe return the result maybe not but uh, gonna do some uh, actions so what you are exploiting there is that probably they are much more allowed from this uh, particular server to access some systems than uh, from your side for example if it's web server most probably you are not able to get some uh, to some internal systems but maybe this web server is allowed to talk to talk to some internal systems and in such a way you can exploit it uh, tip can the like very dangerous attack in that regard is access to cloud services metadata so theoretically if uh, the configuration is bad and there is such vulnerability theoretically you can still access to some uh, administrative access to cloud infrastructure in that way yeah, cloud services are quite popular nowadays yeah, it's quite, quite true. popular. So, for example, you can get administrator access to Amazon uh, AV, uh, AWS. AWS, and um, that's it. So, game over for the company. And uh, how do you do that, for example, if you want to do one and, and get the information? Uh, you s- Again, this is... Uh, <laughs> Quite a lot of uh, possibilities <laughs> there. So, it's just but, um, uh, w- one vector is this server-side request forgery. But uh, then you have to st- still have these vulnerabilities. You you still still have misconfiguration in uh, cloud infrastructure, things like that. So in many cases, vulnerabilities are not just one vulnerability. It's basically chain of vulnerabilities and. Uh, you have to do quite a lot of things uh, badly to get exploited. So. And uh, what tools do they need to use, the hackers, to do the server-side request forgery? 
in many cases just browser gonna be uh, uh, fine and uh, fine enough so probably in browser you can find developer to developers tools and from developers tools you can do quite a lot of damage actually amazing, <laughs> amazing. But, yeah but uh, we usually you are using proxy servers uh, client-side proxy servers like for example burp suite or uh, there is uh, OWASP, uh, OWASP Zap Proxy, uh, if I uh, think uh, quoting correctly. So these are much more easier tools. So basically these are proxy servers which are running on the same machine, usually on the same machine as your browser, and you are able to see all the, all the basically traffic between server and browser and mani- manipulate, manipulate it. Uh, send it again and uh, basically understand how it works. How do you determine the risk of level of specific vulnerability? We use experience in most most cases. So basically we have some uh, framework for uh, how, how we are categorizing it. But uh, in general you can use uh, CVSS scores, calculate them. Some clients are asking for them. Common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, but... Uh, Usually we are use experience. For example, if you have, have administrative access or you ca- are able to run commands on the server, so most probably it's very, very high uh, or very urgent uh, vulnerability. And we usually even prepare some uh, interim reports for the client so that he is able to fix it uh, right away. So, uh, How is the r- test report structured and what information does it include? Basically, yeah, it uh, it has some uh, management summary, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for uh, those who are lazy enough to read the, the reports. So, so basically, you have uh, search vulnerabilities count and no, risk. We, we sometimes we we put the count, but basically we list uh, what you can do is the most critical ones. So wh- what is the impact? Uh, because if you say that it's SQL injection, it doesn't uh, tell much, and uh, many people not don't might even not understand what is SQL injection. But uh, in SQL injection case, we might say that you can uh, get the data from database, or if you are able to run the commands, we you can uh, tell you can run commands and things like that. And there is uh, basically a description of the work we done. So what kind of methodologies we are using. What are limitations? For example, if part of the system doesn't work, so we mention it uh, usually. Uh, and then there is description of vulnerabilities listed by the risk levels with technical information. So, so that uh, developer, which is uh, uh, competent enough, uh, are able to reproduce them. So. Ra- uh, do the steps and uh, get to, this, uh, to the conclusion. Sometimes we even include video files, so screen capture files of the steps, how to do it. Amazing. Uh, because it's uh, in, it, it became that uh, nowadays these vulnerabilities might, might be very complex. So basically you might need, for example, four steps to get to the end result, and they are not very obvious. What are the most uh, common mistakes organizations uh, make uh, when it comes to cybersecurity? Security misconfigurations is uh, <laughs> definitely top one. But uh, <laughs> if you look at the vulnerabilities, so basic uh, in the systems, uh, authorization problems are very very common. So that uh, someone is able to access the functionality which uh, they are not supposed to access, then there is uh, quite commonly there are problems with authentication, especially if you are using third party providers. So like. This uh, Google things, uh, banking authentication in Latvia, this uh, Latvia LV authentication, uh, basically federated authentication providers. There are quite a lot of things to where you where someone might uh, do it wrongly, all out uh, too wrongly. So basically, implemented not not in more secure way. So these are the can, can the most popular pro- problems. Cross-site scriptings are very, very popular nowadays. What are the biggest challenges you have faced in your career as a cyber security tester? And how did you overcome them? Uh, biggest challenge actually was uh, to find the market for uh, services. 
because uh, now you are talking about cybersecurity. Well, cybersecurity is very, very important, uh, but the problem is that if you look at 2004, for those who remember 2004, or to e- to even 2000, uh, no one was talking about cybersecurity. So no one actually cared. There, there was not such a word, cybersecurity, and uh, it's it's becoming e- much more easier to sell, of course, these services because people are more aware about risks they are facing. But uh, previously, for example, no si- penetration tests are not very cheap. Uh, never been very cheap because people are uh, spending quite a lot of time doing them and basically you have to compensate them for this time and uh, when you have a choice uh, do pen test or buy some new user uh, nice used car so or implement some uh, new feature in your system or just do pen test uh, sometimes people are choosing impl- let's implement some new system in the system not uh, which which causes feature. more no, additional threats. No, it doesn't threats. mean that it's going to cause more more problems. But uh, still, if you are doing pen test, what you're going to get is the report uh, how bad your system is. Usually, you have to fix it. You have to pay for fixing in many cases, and uh, and always and then there is question: Does the pen tester have found all the flaws? So what I'm telling clients that uh, we are won't be able to find all the flaws. We we're gonna try to find most of them, but there still might be some things which are not uh, discovered during during pen. So basically, you are paying quite a lot of money for a uh, report, and the pen test companies may, might choose not to do testing. So they might quote you big money for uh, for the pen test, and basically says, "Oh, everything was fine." <laughs> <laughs> So basically, make a short report and uh, profit. <laughs> okay, uh, I think let's start wrap this. Start wrapping this up. Uh, I have two last questions in my mind. Uh, one would be, what advice do you have for aspiring uh, cybersecurity testers that looks up to advance their careers? Uh, nowadays, it's actually they can uh, these CTFs you mentioned. It are very good things. Uh, participate in. Uh, bug bounty programs so they are hacker one and uh, background for example and uh, try to gather experience so basically the experience is what matters actually so more you're going to test more you're going to be able to find so and uh, the ctfs they might help as well but uh, I, I would recommend uh, start doing uh, more real systems if you are interested in web application security port swigger has very good uh, web, web web security academy so basically list of uh, ctfs you can uh, do they they're gonna be quite challenging in the end but the the first ones are very very easy yeah, and the last question that i like is uh, what is your favorite quote in life like your go to quote if you have one i don't have one you don't have one <laughs> <laughs> no one has a quote in life what's going on seriously okay then i think we can do uh, wrap up Right, and uh, a big thank you everyone who joined and listened to our discussion with Agris, where we talked about the IT center, about cybersecurity and penetration testing, uh, who they are, what they are, how they performed, and what challenges and tendencies they have. It was quite an insightful discussion. I think you would agree, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if you enjoyed listening, feel free to follow our podcast on Spotify or YouTube, where we'll publish more episodes with experts from different software engineering fields. If you have any comments or anything you'd like to share or topics you'd like us to cover in the next episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our Instagram profile, Facebook or LinkedIn pages. Uh, You can find us by the name Tesdo Lab and uh, let's keep advancing your skills and knowledge set and uh, see you at the next one. Thank you, Agris, that you joined. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.